I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. Living in a developed world doesn't mean the potential for green space is gone. And in a world of ever-increasing urban density, adding green space back in wherever we can is vital for a healthy, sustainable future. Without plant material, pollution builds up, air quality is diminished, temperatures rise, and really, our surroundings aren't as visually pleasing without life-giving greenery. The idea of growing plants vertically to improve our living spaces isn't a new one. The mystical hanging gardens of Babylon were rumored to flow down palace walls. And today, green walls take these earlier gardening traditions quite a bit further. These days, with the challenges of even finding suitable growing space, living walls are one of the newest trends in gardening. Just as centuries ago, a green or living wall can be freestanding or part of a building that's partially or completely covered with green vegetation. But today, modern innovations have made the installation and maintenance a whole lot easier. The benefits of a living wall are many. Because they're densely planted, living walls can help cool a home's interior and help insulate your home in winter, and even help with noise reduction and provide much needed habitat for wildlife that are so often displaced in our developing world. And from an environmental standpoint, all plants help absorb greenhouse gases. And finally, adding plants in and around buildings helps reduce stress, improve health, and it can even help businesses attract more patrons. York Village, Maine is a bustling tourist destination steeped in history, and a common stop for many visitors here is the historic Emerson family home. It's a special place where history meets forward thinking in a very unique way. For over 200 years, the Emerson family has lived in this house, renovating it over time and adding modern improvements while always keeping the home's historical significance in mind. Today, the Emerson house is tricked out as a designer model home highlighting its history while also demonstrating how even an older home can benefit from the inspired modern garden ideas like those of living wall designers Chuck Hugo and Maya Travaglia. Chuck and I are co-owners of a landscape design build business here in New England and we create beautiful outdoor living spaces for our customers and we're always looking for ways to push the boundaries on how we can give more, create something new, um, and separate ourselves from the competition. So in the winter, we love to travel because that's our time off. And we were in Paris a few years ago. It was very gray, very cold, and we came upon a beautiful site, which was this vertical garden covering an entire building facade. And we thought, wow, this is very, this environment uh, is very much like our environment at home and you know could we do this at home could we could we make this work in New England and we came back uh, and we're talking with our good friend Lynn Felici Gallant and we decided that we were going to try it we were going to do a vertical garden in New England with native New England plants had never been done and it was just another way that we could push the boundaries bring something new to a fairly traditional culture and incorporate the two of the tradition with the new. So we're doing it. We're creating beautiful outdoor living walls um, in all kinds of environments, some challenging, some more accepting. It's been a wonderful uh, collaborative experience. We've had tremendous uh, res positive response from our clients, from people within the community. One thing I've learned that when you give a plant what it needs, it thrives. And that's been an important lesson for me uh, and transcends many, many levels.
Okay, so these living wall systems, now they can run the gamut from being rather simple to very sophisticated. And I'm told that some people are a little intimidated by installing them on their walls. They think it's kind of complicated, but you know what? It's not. Nothing could be simpler. Now Chuck does all the installations for their company and he's finishing up a project right now. So let's find out exactly what's involved in mounting them on the wall as well as the care and maintenance. Hey Chuck, this looks fantastic. Nice job. Thank you. Tell me though, timing is everything. I'm glad I got here when I did because I want to know exactly how these are mounted to the wall. Can you walk me through that process? Sure can. Uh, it's a pretty simple system. There are these brackets that come with the panels and you simply screw them to the wall or whatever surface you're hanging your panels on. Okay, so this is wood siding, but that means we could do brick or stucco or whatever. It's really more a matter of having the right hardware. Exactly. Okay, so how do these actually connect to the brackets? What do you do to make sure they're on tightly? Sure, on the back of the panel there's a groove and it simply hooks around this bracket and it just hangs on there. Okay, and then just gravity holds it in place, nice and secure. Okay, now I look at your wall and I see some negative space, meaning I see some wall behind the planters, but I've also seen ones where they're all tight together. Is that just a matter of personal preference? Yeah, that's really where the design layout comes in. You can design it as a solid panel or with negative spaces. It's really personal preference. And budget, right? And budget, exactly. Okay, so walk me through the maintenance. What's involved in that? Uh, the biggest thing is keeping the plants moist. Okay, this is like a container on a wall where the ones on my patio and deck I'm watering every day and sometimes twice in the summer. You got to do the same thing here? Exactly, that's the perfect analogy. Okay, good. So what about the plant choices? Because I know some are more ideally suited than others for this. Sure, I mean obviously you have your lighting conditions, hardiness, and the other thing to really consider is something that is drought tolerant, succulents, things of that nature. Yeah, and you also want to pay attention to the color palette. I can tell you've given a lot of thought to that because the colors on this wall really tie in beautifully with the rest of your plants. Very nice job there. Well, thank you very much. Now this job is almost finished, but it had to start somewhere, and that's with the planting of the containers. And I'm going to show you how to do that right now. All right, so you recognize this, right? It's one of those planting containers Chuck had on the wall, and it looks great just like it is. In fact, I could put this on my desk and be very happy. But what does it look like before it gets all planted out? Well, it looks like this. Now, there are several designs of this. This is just one, but I like how it works out. There are 10 compartments right here, and each of these compartments has an absorbent pad. Now, that's nice because it gives the roots a way to wick up some water as long as the plants are in there. But after it's planted, then how do you keep it watered? Well, of course, you could use the hose and spray it once or twice a day, but there are a couple of other ways, like this system right here. Now, this is made for this particular device. It's a mini reservoir and you fill it with water, you attach it at the top, and then there's small holes in the bottom and the water drips through. And this is a true drip irrigation system in the simplest form. But if you wanna get a little more sophisticated or put it on autopilot, and especially if you're gonna stack these up, then you need a different type of drip irrigation. And that would be this kind. Now this is one half inch supply line, and a spaghetti tube, and a drip emitter. And the way this works, it just tucks into the top, like that, the supply line goes down the side, and if you have multiple containers stacked on top of each other, then just add another spaghetti tube and a drip emitter, and you're good to go. And the fun part is when you add the plants, but first things first, we need to talk about the soil. Now the type of soil that you want is just like the soil you put in your containers on your deck or patio, and that's container mix or potting soil. But soil like this, it's really light and fluffy, it drains really well, that's very important, but it also holds good moisture the type of soil that you do not want, topsoil, or the kind that you dig up from your backyard. Although that's good in the right application, it's not good for a container like this. It holds too much water, it's too heavy, and your roots could actually rot when you plant into them, so don't use that. Now when it comes to plant selection, a quick review. If we want these plants to overwinter, we certainly need to pay attention to hardiness zone, or we can just treat them as annuals. And in this case, I have a couple varieties of sweet potato vines, which I'll put out over the front. And oh yeah, some oregano. It's always nice to have some edibles in the mix, right? But whatever you do, just have fun with it. The seacoast town of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, originally known for wild strawberry fields, is a bustling tourist destination filled to the brim with stunning historical architecture. While the buildings are beautiful, the unique gardens of the area were appealing as well. Yet what was missing in this historically hip town were vertical gardens right on the walls of the remarkable buildings. The vision of Keith Limerys, the publisher of a Seacoast Home and Garden magazine, Coastal Home. 
Keith charges editor Lynn Felici Gallant with making it happen, and did she ever. Keith, tell me about how you even came up with a vision to put a vertical garden in New England. Well, we're always looking for new stories for the magazine. Yeah. And Lynn pitched me a story about, you know, Greenwald's vertical gardens for the magazine. Yeah. And I said, well, I really haven't seen one. So she sent me a bunch of pictures. <laughs> Paris, Mexico, California, all different vertical gardens, whether on banks or regular buildings and things like that. Yeah. And then I said, I go, well, that's cool. Maybe it's a little ahead of its time for the magazine. Let's do a story. And then I said, hey, let's do the first vertical green wall in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and have that and showcase it there and show it off to New England and let them know, because I didn't know about it. Let's educate the world and let them know what's going on with the green walls. I could not have been more excited. Not only did I get an opportunity to write a story about something that was cutting edge and new to our readership, but I was going to be part of the first vertical garden in the city. So it was really important to us to have a native vertical garden. We thought it would be the first um, of its kind. And so we uh, came, looked around Portsmouth for the best venue and saw Cava. It had a very European feel to it. And we approached the owners, John and Greg, and again, without hesitating a moment, they said, absolutely, you are welcome to our wall. Uh, I think they had to uh, contact the building owner, who also had no hesitation, and we were off and running. Um, from there, we, ha we knew we didn't have a whole lot of money, that it was going to be a largely volunteer effort and we contacted everyone from the uh, wall systems people to uh, irrigation people to plumbers to lighting people and most importantly to the plant growers and found three that were more than willing to donate the plants for free. I mean, people are really digging this wall. They come by, they take pictures of it, they're pointing at it like they know what's going on already, that they said, came to town and said, Okay, where's that green wall at Cava? Yeah. You know, they come to Portsmouth for, you know, shopping and dining and, and staying around and checking out the place. But this is just another attraction for Portsmouth. Yeah. And it brings, it educates people and lets them know that it's just not a garden in their backyard or something that they could do there. It's something that's, you know, it's in a nice, great urban space. Yeah. You've done a great job, and it's Thank a great you. inspiration for anybody that has a chance to see this. I love it. I'm so proud of it. We're, ha we're having a blast with this. Yeah, you should. So what if you like the idea of a vertical garden, but maybe you're a do-it-yourself kind of person, or you're on a tight budget? Well, that's the case for two of our friends of the show, Monty and Kai. They own a house in Asheville, North Carolina, and now that they're moving back, they're serious about fixing it up. And one of the first things they want to do, install a vertical garden. But they have two rules. It's got to be simple and it can't cost a lot of money. No problem. Check this out. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't think of many things more ubiquitous than the standard pallet. And you know what? They make a pretty darn good vertical garden frame as well. And you can find them everywhere, from dumpsters to behind stores. And usually they're free, but just make sure you check with the manager first. And worst case scenario, sometimes you have to pay a few bucks, but never more than that. Keep this in mind though when you get a pallet. Sometimes they're made of pressure treated wood and you don't want that because you don't want those chemicals coming in contact with your roots. So look for pallets made of untreated wood. Now when you get them home, make sure that you wash them off really well because a lot of times they're gonna be kind of grungy. And when you lay them out on a flat surface, you're gonna notice that sometimes the pallet is gonna have spacing that's different from one side to the other. In this case, this is gonna be our backside where the slats are much wider, but we're gonna cover that up. What are we gonna cover it with? Well, we're going to use some landscape fabric for that. We'll just line it out over the back, cut it to size, and then tack it in with some roofing nails. But you could use staples for that as well. And there's one other layer that we're going to add, and that's a thin piece of plywood. Mainly, that's really there just to protect the house. Now, what other tools do we need? Well, we're going to hang the pallet to the house with these L brackets, so we'll need these. And of course, some screws and anchors. But to make sure everything looks nice, of course, we want to have a level and a tape measure. But really, that's about it. You guys ready to work? Yeah. Ready to work. Okay. Position the empty pallet against the wall where you'll want it mounted and add the hardware before it's full of soil and plants. And speaking of soil, 
Setting the pallet back on the flat surface makes filling the void super easy. Use a good quality potting or container mix that's lightweight and drains well. And don't be stingy when adding the soil at this point. Some will fall out and the rest will settle, but it's important that enough soil remains around all the roots and be sure to leave some for later. We used about six bags total. And then the best part, adding the plants. This pallet garden is just a random design using all edibles. The plants are simply stuffed into place and soil is tucked around each root ball. <laughs> the beauty of this vertical garden, this is 100% edible and it's right outside their kitchen door so it could not be more convenient for access to fresh food. We've got some herbs in here, tomatoes, peppers. We're gonna put the peppers in the top, this area right here. The peppers are gonna get the tallest and they need some room to grow up. So we're saving this area, we're reserving that for all of our peppers. Then, it's simply a matter of mounting it against the wall. Pre-measuring and adding the hardware ahead of time makes this part a lot easier. This is where it's helpful to have more than yourself getting it over here. It's not terribly heavy, but it's a little bit awkward at this point. So we put a cinder block in place just to kind of give us some positioning and leverage. Monty and I held the pallet in place while Kai inserted the screws through the already attached L brackets. Finally, we added some upright pepper plants into the top section and watered all the plants in. it's important to keep the plants thoroughly watered to allow the soil to settle around the roots and to help the plants establish. Well, the guys are already in the house getting their salad bowls ready, but it looks pretty good, doesn't it? And the best part is, I think we met both of their requirements. It was super easy to build, and in real time, it only took about an hour. And the only cost here was the price of the plants and the soil. Everything else was either free or they had the items around the house. Now, I know you probably want to build one like this at home, a vertical garden using a pallet, and we have all that information on our website, and the address is the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. You'll find it under the show notes for this episode. Adding greenery to any vertical space can contribute a lot to the look and improve the environment too. And as we saw today, it doesn't have to be complicated or expensive. All it takes is a few plants, the right container, and a vertical space to hang them. For more information about adding a green wall to your living space, and specifically for the step-by-step -step instructions for making your own pallet garden, be sure to visit our website, and you'll find it under the show notes for this episode. You'll also find other useful links for past episodes and Chef Nathan's recipes and videos, too. The address is the same as our name, growingagreenerworld.com. This is Joe Lample. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.